Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. I'm Laurie Johnston. I'm uh, Executive Vice President of the Sant'Egidio Foundation for Peace and Dialogue. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on the theme of climate, peace and dialogue. I want to remind all of our listeners that simultaneous translation is available in French and Spanish if you just click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. So this is our fourth and final uh, plenary session for our conference on Catholic peace building in times of crisis. And it's been a real privilege to listen to so many thoughtful presentations this week. So I'm very grateful to the conference organizers. We are indeed living in a time of crisis and challenge as there's a more and more stark divide, certainly made worse by the pandemic between zones of peace, prosperity and environmental justice versus zones of conflict, deprivation, and ecological devastation. The war in Ukraine, and also less visible and more longstanding conflicts from South Sudan and Ethiopia to Congo and Colombia, these are creating unprecedented refugee flows, contributing to mass starvation, and impeding prospects for sustainable development. Furthermore, these violent conflicts create huge obstacles for dealing with the existential crisis that is climate change. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis said that everything is connected and he called for an integral and integrated approach to peace, development and ecology because the cry of war's victims, the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth rise as one. So our panel today will examine why the church believes it's so important to connect integral peace integral human development um, and integral ecology and how such an integral approach can be implemented in concrete programs and policies. So it is my honor to introduce our first speaker, Sister Alessandra Smirilli, FMA, who is Secretary of the Holy See de Castri for Promoting Integral Human Development and a delegate to the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. She held previous academic appointments at the Pontifical Faculty of Educational Sciences Auxilium, the Salesian Pontifical University, and the University of Milan Bicocca. Her most recent publication is Donne Economia della Crisi a una stagione di speranza. Sister Alessandra, you've thought a great deal about our interconnected themes today, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts. So thank you, Lori. Uh, distinguished speakers and guests and dear friends, I thank you for inviting me to speak with you today on some of the most pressing issues facing our world and our church. It is for sure a very complex time in which we find ourselves, whether it be politically, economically, ecologically, but also spiritually. And I am confident, though, that the conversations you are having during these days will no doubt contribute to personal and communal renewal, to which we are all, we all, are all consistently called. I do not have to tell you exactly all the ways in which our world suffers now. And indeed, as Pope Francis says, everything is connected. And so our efforts to rebuild our world must also be as comprehensive as the damage we see. Yet, it is so difficult these days. I wish to acknowledge the suffering caused by war in Ukraine, South Sudan, Yemen, Ethiopia, Syria, Mozambique, Af Afghanistan, and many other maybe hidden places and also by gun violence in the United States. It is truly the case that if some of the human family is unsafe or broken, the whole human family feels the pain and the threat. You Catholic peace builders are master of the practice of peace towards true security. This security, which does not entail only the strength of military, or the number of weapons, but in the flourishing, flourishing of every person. As the Catholic concept 
of integral human development calls, calls for you, your work prioritize the dignity of the person and the health of communities, societies, states, and the planet. Through your pursuit of positive pace, uh, through tackling system of structural violence, uh, this, you leave no one behind, uh, despite the magnitude of the issues you face. The world has great need for your wisdom and tenacity in all that it faces right now, from the pandemic to wars to climate degeneration. The Catholic Church, as you well know, a strong tradition of working for peace, justice, and development in an integral fashion. Uh, as we can uh, read in the Popularum Progressio, for peace is not simply the absence of warfare based on a precari precarious balance of power. It is fashioned by effort direct directed day after day towards the establishment establishment of the ordered universe will by God with a more perfect form of justice among men. This is the number 65. I'd like to touch on the concept of integral, integrality as, uh, and share how we as Catholics have a unique contribution to the world of peace and development. As we know, modern peace and security access to healthcare uh, nuclear threat, worsening violence and political division and climate deterioration have cascading effects on the security landscape and they demand a cross-cutting coordinated response. Despite this urgency, the world is increasingly, increasingly, sorry, increasingly <laughs> politically divided and priorities have not been changed as shown through the world's military expenditure in 2021, which topped two trillions. And it was very high even during the 2020, the years of pandemic, the, the, the year we, in when the pandemic starts. The spread of these increasingly destructive technologies is also worrying because new destructive technologies are available to an increasing number of governments. The pandemic is an opportunity to re revisit the concept of human security or the paradigm, which re refocuses the security from that of state and military power to that of the human person, its rights, dignity, and freedom for fear and want. Yet, because of the pandemic, we see now more than ever how interconnected are the challenges we face and more and more are calling for a more holistic approach in our response. The Catholic Church and other faith-based actors are uniquely positioned to promote an integral approach given their presence in contest across many levels of society from local to global and many sectors, including education, healthcare, governance, and more. Take, for example, the Holy See Global Advocacy uh, through this integral lens in the nuclear disarmament field and the adoption of the Treaty of, of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which celebrates its first meeting of state parties right now in Vienna. The legal architecture of nuclear disarmament is like a mosaic, strengthened by various components of the international no nuclear apparatus. Uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and many more. In supporting these various agreements, the Holy See has promoted an integral approach to international nuclear governance. There is also a need to create a single architecture in, others, uh, in other areas as well. There is yet a long way to go, but this is the potential of the church to speak both from
from the peripheries and the center with one integral voice. Another example of integral security at work is food justice, food security and food justice. As we know, many different types of conflicts, conflicts can lead to food insecurity or aggravate existing structural problems that food systems are unable to solve. With the goal of faster production and increased trade, heavy responsibility fall to individual farmers for their lives, their environment, which have strong reper repercussion in, those, in these countries where economy and societies are strongly affected. Yet, this is not just a problem of sustainability of crops, but also of the global market and financial speculations that have introduced distortions that have penalized the poorest countries. The world agricultural system, as it was structured in the last 20 years, has in fact failed. In the process of transforming food system, it's vital to center the respect for dignity of human person, the primacy of agricultural sector and the centrality of small farmers, family farming, and responsible companies which would allow food system to be strengthened and as a potential tool for conflict resolution. Here again, we need a new architecture of rules regarding agriculture on a global level. The concept of integral peace and security are securely grounded in the tradition of integral human development and integral ecology developed by the popes over the years. Just as integral ecology and human development center the human person and foster a culture of care, integral peace is only achieved by centering human dignity and promoting culture of cares and encounter. And this must include addressing inequality, which has only worsened since the COVID-19 pandemic. Catholic peace builders, have a special opportunity to speak not only prophetically with moral weight, Im imagination and creativity, but also extremely practically. This is our strength, being engaged in all sectors of work. In truth, in truth this is a message that all must hear, but not all can say. Additionally, as mentioned by St. John 23, Integral peace means, means also reaching the souls of all. This seems to be the biggest challenge. We must not spare any of efforts to promote a culture, a culture of life, of peace, of care, and to prioritize the least among us and help to alleviate the burden of inequality. Again, the pandemic has shown the danger of the path that leads to a national or individual selfishness. One way the Vatican is engaging in this is through the Laudato Si action platform. Through engagement with seven sectors of societies, dioceses, parishes, religious orders, students, universities, and so on, with seven goals, the Laudato Si goals, Across seven years, you know seven is an important biblical number, the platform seeks to launch actions in response to the calls in Laudato Si to engender ecological conversion. By listening, connecting, collaborating with and empowering communities around the world, we hope to bring about locally owned transformation with a global spotlight. Thank you to all of you who are committed yourself to a plan. And I invite, invite everyone, everyone else to join us in this journey. The Dicastery remains committed to supporting your work in peace and development in whichever way is possible for us, to us. And we rely on your support to identify how we might best bring about the kingdom of God God and the vision of our current Holy Father, Pope Francis. He says in Lumen Fidei, let us refuse, refuse to be robbed 
of hope or to allow our hope to be dimmed by facile answer, answers and solutions which block our progress, fragmenting time and changing it into space. Time is always much greater than space. Space ardens processes, whereas time propels towards the future and encourages us to go forward in hope. It is true that the interconnected nature of crises today make them more difficult to respond to. Yet the reverse is also true. Your positive action to build peace and justice have network effects you may never hear about. Have hope that Lord, the master peace builder, is orchestrating all these things in his time. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Sister Alessandra. Indeed, um, it is our hope in the master peace builder that sustains us through this. And in so many of these crises. Um, we will now turn to our, our second speaker, Aloysius John. Uh, he is from Tamil Nadu, India, uh, and has been Secretary General of Caritas Internationalis since 2019. He joined Caritas Internationalis in 2013 as Director for Institutional Development and Capacity Strengthening. Prior to Caritas Internationalis, he served as coordinator for international development and Asia, Oceania, and Middle East and North Africa, development head for Caritas France. In 2004, he coordinated tsunami operations in Sri Lanka, India, and Indonesia for Secor Catholique and Caritas Internationalis. Aloysius, you've had a chance to observe these issues of climate development and peace from a wide variety of global contexts. Please share a little bit about what you've learned. Thank you, Lodi. Uh, distinguished guest, guest and organize, organizers of CPN conference. It's a privilege and also my pleasure to participate in this conference at a moment when our world today is in crisis and we are all grappling to see how to be creative, uh, create creative solidarity and how we could also put these problems on the table from a faith perspective in order to find the right solution. Climate change, peace and development are three interconnected present day realities fundamental to define our ways of living as communities. Pope Francis in his book, Let Us Dream says, green and social go hand in hand. Climate change and environmental degradations are results of irresponsible selfish attitudes that affect the whole humanity. When communities in Africa and Asia, for example, uh, cannot cultivate due to lack of rains or inundations, they have no choice but to leave their homes, their traditional homelands, in search of means to make a livelihood for their survival. Survival becomes a priority. Development is at stake and they get into a cycle of poverty and this, this in turn triggers problems related to peace and harmony. We have seen this in South Sudan and in many other places of Africa and also in Asia. Compound climate fragilities threat social harmony because the quest for survival leads to confrontation both at the community level between the communities and also at the level of the states between the states. Climate fragilities created by climate change leads to high urban vulnerabilities, uneven economic growth, livelihood insecurities, deficient water and hygiene system, and often malnutrition. The social collateral problems are also important. High level of delinquencies. For example, in the post-independent uh, South Sudan, we could see how cattle raiding, a uh, very traditional activity, become a means for get, getting, uh, getting into trouble or fighting with the, between the communities. Lack of access to education and food insecurity are also other collateral social issues. Often this leads to massive forced human displacement, either as migrants or, or as refugees. In some, in some cases, 
climate changes, fragile, uh, fra fragilities leads to conflict both internal and between states, wherein, for example, water becomes a source of conflict. On the long run, this impinges on peace and harmony internally and between states, and Israel and Palestine is one good example. Caritas Internationalis, a confederation of 162 members spread worldwide, is witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis the challenges created by climate change, peace, and development. Humanitarian responses at times of disaster is getting to be more and more complex, compound, and often protracted in nature. Uh, in the Sahel region, for example, large number of people have left their homes due to inability to cultivate, uh, cultivate their lands, and are on the road to exile and are dispersed in pockets of, uh, pockets of different communities outside their homelands. This in order to ensure, um, uh, ensure their survival. Here Caritas experience, this here, the work of Caritas is jeopardized because these it's very difficult to take up a long-term recovery activities with these communities and ensure sustainable development. For example, in some parts of Syria, uh, due to climate change impact and water situation, people have moved from the arable lands and uh, abandoning them and living in highly vulnerable conditions in, uh, in cities or urban areas. In the new areas of settlement, uh, they are confronted with food insecurity because they do not have the means to produce food and are dependent on international aid. Sometimes they're also subject to fight between the communities, and this is becoming a major issue in, uh, in a state which is under sanction and where poverty is rampant. On the long run, this, pheno this phenomena contributes to aggravate existing political stability, instabilities, and when the pressure is too high, they lead to collateral effects and pressures in the socioeconomic fields. This calls for a long-term solution and strategies. Before these questions, uh, these problems, Caritas Internationalis has a three-pronged approach. An international four-year global campaign, Together We, has been initiated to sensitize communities on the link between environment, development, and social harmony through identification of best practices and uh, new ideas to promote integral ecology in the spirit of Laudato Si. In the second place, Caritas members are working with the communities to promote new forms of agriculture, water management, eco-friendly agriculture using natural resources, etc. This will lead to a progressive new paradigm of community-oriented and community-based development leading to social harmony. Because most of the programs have social harmony as one of the key uh, elements in the, in the project, uh, project architecture. In the third place, Caritas Internationally seizes all the opportunities to be promoters of peace and reconciliation, peace and harmony, by embedding peace and reconciliation in the development activities and also in the disaster responses. For example, in Ukraine, in the disaster response today, Caritas Ukraine is seriously considering how to bring in the dimension of peace and reconciliation uh, in, in, the, in the different activities. So humanitarian concern based on the teachings of Fratelli Tutti is also a means, as Pope Francis calls us, to promote, a new, promote new ways of caring, sharing, accompanying, and defending the poor through creative solidarity. Caritas will continue its advocacy work also to promote peace and reconciliation in, even in the emergency response, as well as in the integral development programs by upholding integral ecology, which is also a key factor and a founding factor, I would say. As a conclusion, I wish to say that the nexus climate change peace and development must be viewed from the perspective of integral ecology, which must be the foundation for integral development. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has brought to evidence that this reality cannot be overlooked and must be seriously taken into consideration. It is absolutely important for faith-based organizations working in the humanitarian field to come together on this issue and reflect on a new integral development paradigm through high level of sharing and planning at the global level. Lastly, integral human development in the spirit of integral ecology can be achieved only if there is a sound network, networking between like-minded NGOs and also collaboration with the universities and research centers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alvesis.
I was really struck by your line that the, the quest for survival often leads to confrontation at both the community and national levels. But what you've also described here is the ways in which that kind of quest for survival, these kinds of crises can also be opportunities for collaboration at the community and hopefully the national level as well. So we're going to turn now to somebody who has worked very much on social cohesion, um, uh, especially on the local level. Joseph Muyango Nsengayire coordinates the Catholic Relief Services Peace and Social Cohesion Project funded by USAID in the Republic of Congo. He has 20 years of peace building and social cohesion and reconciliation programming experience in the Great Lakes and the central region of Africa, especially in Rwanda, Burundi, Central African Republic and Congo, with particular interest in peace building, trauma healing and social cohesion community-based strategies in post-conflict contexts. Joseph, what do you think we should keep in mind about these uh, difficult issues? Uh, yes, and thank you for this introduction. I think as we said for climate development and peace, and from what just have been presented as at global level, we as CRS and as actors working at the grassroots level are seeing really this needs of interconnection of the work that people have to do together to protect and to integrate efforts that have, could bring solutions to the world. And for this important topic that I'm honored to participate in this conference, uh, we highlight how uh, at community level, we experience and we practice the impact of climate change, uh, conflicts, and how they are linked. I think if I refer to the one of the CRS, what we call the push and pull, a story that was trying to capture the impact and the relationship with the human integral and the impact of the environmental destruction at global level, like in examples coming from Bangladesh and other countries where we see that the impacts are bringing it to people to push even we have kind of water flooding that are emerging and that is bringing people to stay connected with the ground. But at the other time, we see that the impact of climate change, how it affects the daily life of people, like in Africa, particularly when giving the examples of the child and see how now the, taking this example of water, in other countries, water become a problem with flooding, with bringing people and mating, but in Africa and other places, we see like child, people are being pushed away from water because of the desert. So, this impact of uh, water, if we do this example, as well the other part of the sarcasm of the persistent exploitation of the natural resources and the, its destruction on the impact of the environment, we are looking it at the ground level, how people with the, <clears throat> with the destruction of the environment are now causing the impact on the, with the proceeds of the impact of resources, uh, exploitation of kind of deforestation and mining exploitation or this, how it's impacting relations on people and how it's being affected with the common good, with the human integral ways it was recommended and that we follow at the grassroots level. And this impact on the population, it is growing and our need of food, our need of water, they have needs of woods to make fire, but the exploitation that are being brought by yeah, multinationals, national community, even the climate change, what impact it gives on them. 
and the consequences on if we see the integration of the peace and social cohesion at community level, we know even today more than 23 million of people are displaced because of this kind of disaster compared to what it's not only war, like we can experiment in other places, but it's also not only the conflict, but the how the disaster and the climate change is impacting life of people and how it can create tensions among communities. That's how at community level, there are some initiatives that I can maybe give the, that are trying to respond to the gap between the reflection on what is happening, as I just said, at the grad level impact of climate change, uh, environment exploitation at community level, and the work that is being done by researchers on the environmental study. We have this gap from what is being observed in the community and how it could be adapted to make the people yeah, surviving what they are living. And from this, I think the, all countries that we are working on, we said like, <clears throat> like even the DRC, Congo, Central Africans, we all depend on uh, natural resources, which are sensitive to climate variability and to climate change and development of technology. We saw, and I think yesterday, even when they were presenting about the technology and how resources are exploited to put this development, how is impacting the community and how efforts at community level, what we are trying to do as a CRS, as an organization, as the church, to reflect and to create awareness from the community in the light of, I can take the example of the, in the light of the <clears throat> social doctrines of the church, or in particular, the, the encyclical love, without to see reflections with the initiatives that are being brought by the church in Africa, in Madagascar. I think the people have the network, and even my the previous presenter talked about how we can create platforms. And we saw since 2015, what we call the ecclesial network of the Congo Basin, that is regrouping the countries that are around the basin of the Congo River and the basin in the, the forest of the equatorial. For these countries and the church bringing kind of justice and peace commission to reflect, I think it's also equal what started before and what is most even advanced with the, the church in the South America, who is working to protect the Amazon and draw a glacial network for the an Amazon reform. So I want to link this through what we are doing to the community, the reflections that are being done by the church, but also equal the limitation of reflection that are being carried at globally, national level, and the impact people are living at community level. And what can be done as a point is how this, can we connect this impact of the environment, this needs to contribute to the human development, integral human development, how this reflection that are being held at globally, nationally, or regionally can be discussed at community level. I think with the church structures and like of Justice and Peace Commission, who are key partners of this reflection here with the Ecclesial Network, reflecting on the Basin of Congo or with different countries where CRS is collaborating with local churches to see the impact that is being affected the community. How can we develop practices to sensitize? Because we play this key role at community level who are living this discussion, but at national level, how to create this linkage. And as a conclusion, I will say, as we believe at CRS, that 
there is no limit to what we can achieve with shared vision and the commitment. Ownership, sustainability of this strategy, alleviate the community sufferance and work on conflict transformation at community level with the population who are being affected by this crisis, this important topic at the world level, will bring much solution and bring, as we, we always say, if we promote dialogue on all kinds of challenges that we are facing at community level with positive mind and acknowledge the gap that are being created with the scarcity of resources and the exploitation that is being conducted. This kind of reflection at community level include all stakeholders and create a network that is linking the horizontal efforts that are being done with churches at local level, with initiatives by CRS and other organizations, human development, who are aware with this kind of discussions. And the programs that are being developed at national and national level. So this is how with SIDP again, we believe as CRS that we can work together and contribute to uh, respond to this global crisis and improve relationship and well-being at community level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, that was a, a powerful description of how important it is to create linkages between the concerns of local communities and the broader national and international conversation. And I was struck that you mentioned um, the, the impact of mining um, on all of these issues. That's something that the CPN has taken up recently in our book on Catholic peace building and mining. And it certainly offers many examples of both the possibilities and the challenges of creating those kinds of linkages between the local, communal, and the global, the international. So um, we're turning now um, to Catherine Marshall, uh, who is our next speaker. She's a senior fellow at Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, where she leads the center's work on religion and global development. She's also a professor of the practice of development, conflict, and religion in Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service. She helped create and now serves as the executive director of the World Faiths Development Dialogue. She's also the co-editor of Women, Religion, and Peacebuilding, Illuminating the Unseen. And Catherine, you've thought a lot about the connections between gender issues and climate development and peace. What do you think is important for us to keep in mind at this point? Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, happy to be with you. Um, rather than focus in the first instance on the gender issues, which are indeed very important for these networks to take seriously, I wanted to reflect a little bit inspired by what you, Laurie, and Sister Alessandra opened with, which is this particular moment of crisis that we're facing. Um, it is in many ways unprecedented, both in the depth of the challenges that we face, um, but also in the very obvious interconnections that come out so starkly through the COVID pandemic, where <clears throat> one country's, one sector's role affects the others, but also through the war in Ukraine and then the knock-on effects in terms of prices, um, energy supplies, supply chain, uh, et cetera. And I think what we have hoped from the very beginning uh, of the, the series of crises was that this could be a Kairos moment, that it could be what's often called a moment of grace and opportunity when forces come together, uh, the sense of a common humanity, the sense of urgency, uh, and that that would bring the religious and the non-religious, um, different hemispheres of the world, different continents, different 
worldviews um, together to try to confront what the United Nations um, in the um, Sustainable Development Goals has identified as the five Ps, um, peace, prosperity, planet, uh, people, and partnerships. Um, so the this conference, this theme uh, today is focusing very much on those five, the five of five um, uh, different parts. So I think that we, we see the challenge um, and yet turning to some of the challenges, there's a great danger that we will dissipate this moment and simply mumble or um, blunder forward, uh, looking to return to normal and spending far too much effort on um, the, the practices that we know and understand. And I think that this is where in this complex, I see special roles for the religious communities, which combine both the depth of the ethical reflections, the very practical on the ground, grounding in reality, and also this call to a prophetic voice that looks beyond the immediate crises. So I think that's what we're looking at is, is the possibility of, the, of the, uh, the Kairos moment. So, but what are the obstacles? Um, I think looking at the COVID crisis, which we at the Berkeley Center and with the Joint Learning Initiative have looked at from March, 2020, I'm very conscious that none of us, I think Sister Alessandra and the um, COVID Commission, that no one could have imagined that two and a half years later, we would still be grappling with basic issues of equity and vaccination. Um, and in the, the many, many effects of the COVID crisis on the economies, on debt, uh, and of course on food, people talk about COVID. So I think that the, the danger of missing the chance to look fresh, to look with the prophetic voice is particularly great as po crises pile one on the other. But I also want to emphasize the complexity of this insight that has been referred to several times of the interconnections, the very essence of these five Ps that the planet crises are linked to development, are linked to peace, are linked to the ways that public and private, religious, non-religious work together. Uh, I had an experience a few years ago of organizing many sessions on poverty at a large inter-religious gathering. And one of my friends was working on the uh, environment segment of the same meeting. And we agreed that we should come together uh, at some point rather than dealing in silos with these issues. But when at the very end of the meeting we came together, uh, we found that there was tremendous tension between the two groups, that the environment group was so horrified by the, by the implications of economic growth that they literally wanted to see degrowth a stop. And yet the development people said, first of all, there's no hope if we don't offer a better life for the people who are poor and vulnerable. Uh, and besides, they're not going to listen anyway. There's no way of stopping the momentum. And so you had a, a clash between well-intentioned people and any issue that you get into mining, which Laurie has just referred to is an excellent example that mining can be the hope of a country, but it can also be the destruction. And so each, it's easy to say uh, that we need to deal with the interconnections among sectors, among countries, cross boundaries, but it requires that prophetic voice and that discipline uh, that I think we all need in dealing with every issue. So my particular focus has been on the intersection between the religious and the non-religious. And there's a somewhat hackneyed phrase that people say that if you're not at the table, you end up at the menu. 
Uh, and I have to say that in talking about what we term the global agendas, which is the sustainable development goals, these five Ps, but it's many other uh, efforts that are multilateral, um, many coming from private, many from public, to try to address um, these issues. But that it is increasingly difficult to see in these global agendas how these voices of the Catholic social teaching, but more broadly, the interreligious voices are coming, partly because they are very divided. They often speak different languages. And so in many settings, including the United Nations, the regional organizations, European Union, ASEAN, uh, but also the G7, which meets this weekend, and the G20, to find effective ways to have these religious voices bringing forward their essential proposals. Uh, and to me, their powerful moral call, call to address always to have in mind the preferential option for the poor, meaning that you never forget those who are suffering, the refugees, the children who are separated, the millions of orphans that have been created as a result of the COVID crisis. And Sister Alessandra emphasized, and it is very much on the top of my agenda, finding better ways to deal with these issues of inequality. And the issues of inequality do mean, in many ways, this preferential option for the poor, the idea of leaving no one behind, of bringing, uh, keeping a constant focus on those who are suffering most in the wars and the conflict, whether it's Ethiopia, Ukraine, Southern Thailand, uh, but also how the structural political power issues are affecting these problems of inequality and how we can build what really is a powerful momentum the progress that we have seen over the past decades in lifting people out of poverty and giving people whose lives through most of history were very constricted, the possibility of developing their potential, their gifts. And so I think that we have a very large agenda before us. I think this conference has highlighted many of the problems, the challenges, but also the areas of hope and the potential as we look ahead. Catherine, thank you so much for that challenge to all of us. Your, your description of this as a Kairos movement moment really reminded me of Pope Princess's remarkable um, Urbi et Urbi address uh, at the beginning of the pandemic alone in St. Peter's Square where he really called us to see the pandemic as a reminder that we are in the same boat in many ways. Although at the same time, inequality means that we feel the impacts in terribly different ways sometimes. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to turn now uh, to our, our last panelist, uh, Aaron Lothus, um, to do some theological reflection on these topics. She is an associate professor of theology at St. Elizabeth University and a senior program manager for the Laudato Si animators program <clears throat> with the Laudato Si movement. Her research focuses on energy ethics as well as faith-based environmental movements. And she's served as an Earth Institute fellow at Columbia University. She's the author of the books, Inspired Sustainability, Planting Seeds for Action, and The Paradox of Christian Sacrifice, The Loss of Self, The Gift of Self. Erin, what does this bring to mind in terms of the relationship between theology, practice, and climate development and peace? Well, thank you, Lori, and thank you to the organizers for this important conversation. It's a privilege to be with this distinguished panel addressing such a critical topic. The reflections that are foremost in my mind are about the justice issues in responding to the climate crisis while enabling development to take place for those nations 
who have been left behind. As has been said, uh, climate change is intensifying not only storm impacts, heat, drought, uh, hunger, and of course, massive refugee flows around the world, climate change is increasing violence. Studies show that climate change increases the risk of armed conflict within countries by anywhere from three to 20%. And research indicates a statistically significant correlation between worsening climatic conditions and displacements of people. We know that uh, there is projections of over 200 million refugees by 2050. So what these massive dislocations of people cause is not only untold suffering uh, as they lose their homelands and their livelihoods, but also the increase of conflict in the new areas where they uh, are now forced to reside. Migrants gather in urban slums, which are themselves most prone to impacts of climate change, to mudslides and to floods, uh, intense disasters, natural disasters like storms can ignite conflict by threatening people's sense of stability and long-term impacts on water, crops, and disease risk uh, further violence and uh, relocation. So if we think about the scale of this crisis, we know that we will likely reach a warming of 1.5 degrees between 2030 and 2050 if changes are not made. And even so, Global warming cannot be stopped immediately. We have a certain amount of warming already baked in to the system. To have a 50% chance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, greenhouse gas pollution must peak by 2025. That's in three years. Greenhouse gas pollution must peak, meaning that 60% of oil and fossil methane gas must remain unextracted. 90% of coal must remain unextracted. We have an immediate need to stop uh, extracting and combusting those fossil fuels. What does that mean for the development needs of, uh, of nations that have been left behind? Well, on the response side, on the adaptation side, we need peace building strategies to help local populations adapt to climate change. Uh, as Joseph was saying, we need to create methods for social cohesion, uh, peacemaking practices where in cities under migration pressures, inequalities and grievances can more easily lead to conflicts and agitation. We need to strengthen regional organizations' ability to handle climate fragility across borders. So that's on the response side, on the mitigation side, on the develop, I'm sorry, the adaptation side. On the mitigation side, in the hopes to uh, mitigate and reduce the impacts of climate change, it's essential to invest in green infrastructure and energy systems. However, as Catherine was just noting, this leads to a justice tension in terms of the fair needs of developing nations for their own development. We have to acknowledge their rights to development. And yet the tension is to balance this against the existing carbon budget, the carbon budget that runs out in 2025. So what guidance do we receive on this from Catholic social teaching? Laudato Si states, first of all, that there's an urgent need to develop policies to limit emissions and substitute for fossil fuels. We know that. We know that the Laudato Si action plan, which Sister Alessandra referenced, 
calls for divestment. We know that uh, impact investing is key. Laudato Si also notes that the developed countries ought to help pay their ecological debt by significantly limiting their consumption of non-renewable energy. That's paragraph 52. This is very, very important because it shows that developed countries need to take the responsibility to first, to be the first ones to bring down their consumption of fossil fuels, to develop the renewable energy technologies. A document published by the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace called Energy Justice and Peace writes that advanced countries have the moral duty of developing these complex and new renewable energy technologies in order to allow poor countries to feed their development. In other words, poor countries should have priority use of the remaining fossil fuels in the carbon budget. And in order to enable that to take place, it's essential to fund the Green Climate Fund to sh share renewable energy technologies, to allow them to be scaled up and implemented in developing nations without incurring costs or patent barriers. And of course, developing nations, uh, already developed nations need to massively scale up their renewable energies as well. What we find at a lower tech solution is the advantage of creating green spaces, which Pope Francis also writes about in Laudato Si, that green spaces are necessary in our urban areas. They're places for peace, they're places for restoration, and it's unjust that they exist in the wealthier parts of our cities. But building green spaces has also been noted as a source of social cohesion. Peace building and ecological restoration can go hand in hand. Studies of constructing green spaces in Colombia and in marginalized communities in the United States that have suffered from redlining, from discriminatory housing practices, show that building green spaces and planting trees leads to social cohesion, leads to uh, community gathering and community harmony. And in some of the studies related to uh, marginalized community in the United States, where temperatures are actually higher because of a lack of trees. Planting trees not only restores property values and reverses the effects of years of injustice, but it creates livability in overly hot neighborhoods. And of course we know about the critical need for reforestation all over the globe. So, as we consider the nexus of climate change and development and conflict, we need to put our hope in green energy and in shady spaces, in urban gardens, in replanted areas, in reforestation. All of this is essential for peace and harmony in a warming world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, it is a striking thing to think of trees uh, as a means of promoting social justice, uh, planting trees in the US. Um, certainly it's an issue that we're very aware of, but um, deforestation as an issue globally too. Um, I appreciate you concluding on a moment of hope because it seems like so often we hear discussions about climate impacts and just find ourselves feeling hopeless, feeling like it's inevitable that the climate impacts we're facing are going to lead to war, conflict, violence, no matter what we do. And yet um, our faith reminds us uh, that peace is always possible um, and that we have choices that we can make here. Uh, and so we're 
called to provide hope by pointing out some of those choices as you've done. Thank you so much. So we're now turning to our um, discussion uh, portion of the panel. And so I'd like to invite all of the viewers, if you would like to share questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, please feel free. Um, and I'd like to ask all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on so that we can be together at least on the screen, if not in reality, uh, for the remainder of the conversation. I'll, um, I'll start us off with one question about integration, because we talk all the time about integral ecology, integral development, integral peace. Um, but as Catherine pointed out, um, these issues are all really complex and it is difficult to integrate them. So I want to ask um, Sister Alessandra uh, to start us off in particular, are there some lessons learned about how we can integrate these issues and how not to do it, um, especially given your um, uh, expertise in economics? I, um, may have some some insights to offer about the interconnectedness there as well. Could I invite you to um, unmute yourself uh, and thank you. Yes, thank you. I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but when you were asking, I, I had something in mind and I said, maybe this is the key. I was thinking uh, and also during the conversation that uh, maybe we are missing someone into this discussion. Uh, and these are young people, the youth. And uh, I think this can be the key uh, for lesson to learn, because we know that uh, they, the, the young generations now, they are deeply concerned. Uh, they, they are um, aware of the, of, of the fact that everything is connected and everyone is connected. We are all connected. They put together all the issues. They don't make differences uh, among peace, uh, ecology, economy, and so on. And I'm referring to a practical experience I'm uh, dealing with, which is this group uh, of economy of Francesco, young economists called by Pope Francis to build another way of, uh, of doing economy and business and so on. And so I think this can be an inspiration. When we want to address uh, issues and challenges uh, in an integral way, integral way, we should uh, give the floor to young people because they are native, not only digital, but only uh, also ecological and uh, for a new economy and so on. And sometimes we, we feel that uh, uh, we should allow them to say something. I say that sometimes uh, how are, we should have the courage to make a, a step back and uh, leave them the, I would say the protagonist of uh, lead the discussion and actions. They need us, but they are perfectly capable to, to do something more because they are deeply convinced. Uh, so I don't know if I answer, but uh, this was in my mind when you were asking the question. Wonderful. The youth as the future of integration. Would, would any of our other panelists like to tackle this question? The, the challenge of actually um, integrating. Yeah, Aloysius, please. Oh, uh, I think you are still muted. As Sister uh, Smirini said, I don't know whether I'm going to respond to your question, but I have a reflection on this. Um, I was in the Philippines in Mindanao, and there uh, we were in uh, with a television team and one of the persons there was plucking fruits from the trees. And there the, the indigenous, indigenous community said, uh, when the discussions, we don't pluck more than what we need for our day-to-day -day life. And that struck me. And from this, if I extrapolate from this, I think we are in a world which is selfish, 
there is a lack of responsibility, social responsibility, and uh, there is lack of natural solidarity today. So the question today for us is how do we, as Sister said, uh, Smerile said, how do we create awareness? And this is where the youth are the future for us. How do we create awareness of this? That is, I'm responsible for my neighbor. And Pope Francis uh, brought it out very clearly during the COVID-19. He said, uh, this pandemic has told us that we're all interconnected. We need each other, not just to save ourselves uh, from the pandemic, from the contamination, uh, from the contagious, contagious effect of the virus, but also to come out of this pandemic. But I think very soon we have forgotten that. Today, it's as if the new beginning is something which is going to be as usual. It is not going to be as usual. So the question today is how do we build this stewardship? And also this idea of basic justice. The basic justice, which means, for, but through which I mean that today we all have to live in a, in a just world. And the poorest also has the right to be treated in, in the just way, has the right to have access to different things. And these are the things I think we need to bring awareness on um, to the young people and our youth today, and, and also the children, uh, they are uh, in the schools, uh, they are the ones who are going to be the ones who will uh, bring this idea of interconnecting uh, the different elements in the society in order to make this integrate, uh, integral ecology uh, a real, uh, a real uh, uh, a reality. And another aspect also is today, I think it's also very important to put in all our reflections, the human person at the center. Uh, linking this with the environment. I think there is also sometimes a tendency to forget that in our, in our program, uh, program planning. How do we constantly keep this in mind is another challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Catherine. Uh, I wanted to echo what Sister Alessandra was emphasizing on youth. And I think that brings us to two other dimensions. One is that many of the exciting youth initiatives and passions that we're seeing are linking the religious and the non-religious. Um, they're cutting across these sectors and building on that I think is, is important. Um, I think the other obvious that I don't think we've mentioned very much is the power of the new social media, which obviously has its negative sides, but also has its positive. I would also add, we were part, I was part of a research team uh, that looked at the evidence for religious engagement in the full range of SDGs, uh, the development issues. And one of the things that struck us that was that we were looking at at least 13 disciplines. Uh, and we all know that interdisciplinary work is not easy. Um, I was citing the example of how the climate people found much to worry about in the development people. And likewise, I've also worked with development people who seem to be fairly skeptical about the peace builders because they don't really understand what they do. And the peace builders think that the development economists do nothing but sit in the central bank. So I think that we have a ferocious challenge of cross-cutting interdisciplinary work as we try to move forward. So that's a very general statement, but I hope it has some threads that we might find useful. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to turn to a question from the audience now um, that I think is best addressed to Erin, because um, uh, Questioner asks um, about the role of politics in the United States. You were focused on the importance of um, wealthier countries taking responsibility for their fossil fuel usage. Uh, this question says, the issue of reducing dependence on fossil fuels is a political issue in the US. How aggressive should Catholics be regarding political advocacy in order to meet the responsibility of Catholic social teaching? It's a challenging one for you. <laughs> well, we're in a peace building uh, conversation here. I don't know if we want to use the term aggressive, but I think uh, Catherine used the term prophetic and I think also pastoral. Climate change has impacts on the well being of people and all communities of life, it is a life issue. It affects the poor. 
people suffer as a result of climate change. And as Catholics, we are called to reduce that suffering and to acknowledge our complicity by being part of energy systems that drive climate change. So as a part of our Catholic values, our Catholic faith and our Catholic spirituality, we need to work for a better world system. And that, in, that does indeed mean um, voting and voicing our values, but uh, we will be more effective if we avoid partisan language, divisive language, and as a community of faith, indicate that we are advocating for healthier energy systems. There is nothing healthy about coal that emits mercury and ends up in the blood systems of pregnant women, uh, damaging the uh, neurological systems of their unborn babies. There is nothing healthy about toxic runoff from mines uh, and um, coal, coal extraction systems. There is nothing healthy about particulate matter um, all around the world. These are risks to the well-being of life that we must address. And there's nothing healthy about climate impacts. We most certainly have a tangle with the vested interests in our government um, that are committed to perpetuating the fossil fuel infrastructure. And we need to be clear about that. And we need to be clear about who is funding um, and supporting the campaign uh, coffers of our represented leaders. But primarily, we need to approach this from a faith perspective um, as advocates for, for the poor and for everyone because climate change affects every single person. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> as, as Joseph said, we all depend on natural resources, every single one of us. Um, Joseph, I would like to turn back to you now uh, to touch again on your point about connections between local communities, national, international levels. Sister Alessandra had said that this is a strength of the church, right? That um, it's present from local to global. Uh, but it still can be really challenging, I think, for individuals to connect what they're doing on a local level to what's being done on the national or international level. And sometimes um, even individuals who are very concerned feel helpless because these issues feel so enormous or far away. Um, like uh, my students who I remind, um, they probably have some coltan in their phones that was mined in the Congo. And so they're connected to what's happening there. And yet then what are they to do with that knowledge? And that's something they, and sometimes I struggle with as well. So you identified this as a problem, but can you also share some ways in which um, you've tried to overcome this and to make connections between local concerns and higher levels when it comes to, to peace and climate? No, thank you. Uh, this is a great question. How to connect the grassroots, the community, and create this kind of <clears throat> platform that is being a kind of creating a gap, as I mentioned. But what I this brings me to the I was discussing, I think it was last week with. Uh, uh, the priest who is in the net, the ecclesial network for the uh, Congo Basin that is discussing this kind of issue of environment and impact, and who in the action they have is to do researches and to create kind of community dialogue on the impact, but not only on the impact but also to understand and to listen all community members, what are the solutions they are bringing to this issue? And I think even it's coming to the first question for integration, how we can integrate sister. Alessandra told me about the youth, 
how is their responsibility, how they are engaged at the community level. Yeah, it's the same what I can now, even with the mining, the, the destruction of resources, the need of clean water, the need of food at community level, where solutions will be coming, who will contribute to this. The, it will be how with the creation of spaces, local kind of, um, I can say, action research, but also reflection at community level that are bringing up to national or regional and international level, how do we disseminate the results we have? Because the reflection that are being brought at global level or national level, there is, when I was discussing with the priest in China, he said, we have challenges to disseminate at parish level and community level. We go in workshop, we discuss, we know these kind of challenges, but we are not disseminating. It's the same, I can say, the way to bring solutions is also to help to hear the voice of the community and what are the solutions they are proposing? Because always we think solutions can come outside of them, but they can contribute in creating protective methods and even creating the way because they will not, if they are using, like I said in the reflection done by CRS, another organization, we know that the traditional way of exploitation of mining is more impacting the environment, even the water and the things. But if it's a modern exploitation, what are the composition? What are the, the measure and the listen? How it will still give community land? So I think here the community helps a dialogue, economic discussions, and bring this through. The, we said the gap between the researches and on peace and the environment, but I think if they work together and they integrate this from what is happening at the community level, what are the solutions they propose? Because the, the complexity of the contradiction from the technology, the development, they will not say we are not going to continue exploitation, but how it can be done and protect the community height can be done and have responses to the needs of the community. The impact, I think this is how I briefly I can say the answer to have this kind of vertical yeah, horizontal discussion, but also the vertical discussions and disseminate what is being done at the community, but also disseminate to the community what are the policies and discussions that are globally giving the as the plan of action because communities sometimes never know even if there are actions or solutions that are proposed globally. Thank you. Thank you. And those seem like concrete ways to really help people even at the, the grassroots level feel a sense of agency when it comes to these, these issues. So um, one thing that climate change and war and poverty all have in common is that they particularly affect women uh, who often suffer the most um, and are marginalized in policies and decision-making in this regard. And Sister Alessandra, it's um, a, a source of great hope to me and many others that you are now the first woman to be the secretary of your dicastery. And so I'd love to ask you, what do you think can be done to better promote and empower the role of women in peace building and in responding to these interconnected crises? Thank you. Well, first of all, I think we need to give voice to women. We discovered, for example, during the pandemic that uh, the women were the most affected uh, in Italy, the, the amount of women uh, that who experienced uh, uh, job loss during the, pandem the, the pandemic was enormous, and uh, so in many other places. But what we discovered during the pandemic, that the states 
and governments led by women were most, more successfully in general to deal with the emergency and uh, uh, the care required uh, to handle the, this emergency. And so this means that uh, we need to give voice. I mean, you can say, okay, but how? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I think starting from our uh, circles, Sometimes uh, we see panel uh, discussion without women because we are not able to find women to speak because we are not looking uh, at the right places. And, uh, and this is just a small step, uh, but uh, we need much more. Pope Francis is doing his part, but this means that uh, he's trying to uh, lead by example and bishop conferences can do more. Uh, and, um, and local churches is as well. And so at that political level, uh, it's important that uh, we hear the voice of women, but at, at the same time, as women, we need to be more proactive and uh, let our voice be heard, uh, especially uh, for this, um, um, I mean, specific field, which is peace building. Um, we, so you uh, are organizing something very meaningful and you can give space, but sometimes we just need to uh, take our space, I mean, to, to be proactive, to speak, to organize something, to let uh, our voice to be heard uh, and to be there. Everyone can, I think, remember the images of nuns praying in front of uh, weapons or um, uh, militaries, you know? Uh, and so we need to do that. We need to, to stay uh, where is needed, sometimes at risk, but to show that uh, we are uh, fighting for peace. Fighting, sorry, is not the right term, the right word, but we are there struggling for peace. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, those, those images, especially the sisters in Myanmar recently have been really inspiring. Wonderful. Um, there's one question from uh, the audience, which I'd like to address to whomever would like to answer it. This is about the Green Climate Fund. Uh, the questioner says, I've heard that the mandate of the fund is to support mitigation and adaptation efforts in developing countries. It seems that the Green Climate Fund is focusing more on mitigation than adaptation. And we know that there's an enormous need for climate adaptation funding. Are there efforts underway to advocate for more focus on adaptation? Someone like to speak to that? Perhaps, um, Erin, could you maybe talk to us a little bit about the distinction between mitigation and adaptation in, in the Green Climate Fund, for starters at least? Sure. So adaptation means responses that help people and communities and ecosystems adapt to increasing heat and other impacts. Uh, mitigation means policies, practices, efforts to reduce the, uh, the fact of climate change, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, um, to reduce deforestation, to reduce harmful agricultural practices, so mitigation tries to uh, give us less climate change. Adaptation tries to help us survive the climate change 
impacts that we're already experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I could tell you more about the range of projects uh, within the Green Climate Fund. They are known for uh, supporting energy, um, energy projects and scaling those up, which falls under the category of mitigation, but there are also many adaptation projects, um, for example, protecting uh, damaging damage to coral reefs, et cetera. So there are both kinds in terms of advocating for increased, um, increased adaptation. I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Aloysius, maybe I could ask you, um, is, is climate adaptation something that is a key priority in Caritas's programming at this point? Um, but you need to unmute. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in many of the programs we have, uh, climate adaptation is one key area where funds are allocated today, uh, because it also helps the communities uh, to put in place different kinds of activities, uh, which will also help them to cope up with uh, the changing situation or the impact of the, uh, of the climate, uh, climate changes. Um, it also helps them, for example, water harvesting and, uh, and uh, other different kinds of agricultures. Uh, these help them to have this uh, survive from the impact of the climate change. Uh, in India, for example, there are water uh, harvesting ponds which have been created, which help them to irrigate their lands. So yes, uh, these are uh, priority areas for Caritas, yes. Great, thank you. We are almost at the end of our time. So I'd like to just ask if any of our panelists have any remaining thoughts that they'd like to share about Catholic peace building and the intersection of climate and peace and development. The floor is open to anyone who uh, has a final thought still there. Yeah. And I see. Uh, Please, okay. Joseph. Yeah, thank you. That one, so it was about, we, I talked about, internal in the church, the capacity, there are all these initiatives, even as uh, Lois just talked about the Caritas Internationalist and the other four different projects. But I'm thinking about the capacity of the stakeholders in the church at a different level, diocese, even parishes, to help this capacity of analysis of the integration of environment and uh, climate change and peace, what actions. So I think there is a need to increase and to continue build the capacities of the actors and so they can connect really with the community and find the solutions. We know as CRS, we have this community work and know the role of inclusion of all members. We talked about women, youth, even handicapped people, everyone at the community has their role. But how we have actors and people who can motivate them and think on solution of this integration in one unit. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So now is the time for me to thank all five of our panelists. It's, it's really been a privilege to listen to each of you. And I'm sure our audience would join me in saying so if they were able to. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for all of your insights. And I also want to thank um, uh, on behalf of all of the organizers of this conference, all of the institutions who have uh, sent their representatives to this plenary, who have sponsored our conference. Um, we had uh, more than 25 co-sponsoring institutions. It's really been a remarkable event uh, with such a wide variety of, of topics geographical diversity. We've had 75 speakers from 30 different countries, not to mention many different time zones. 
And over a thousand people have registered for this conference, which was only possible because of so much collaboration among these different uh, organizations. So on behalf of everyone uh, who's been able to attend, I want to thank Notre Dame's Kroc Institute and the Catholic Peace Building Network's Secretariat for hosting and being the lead coordinator of this conference. And of course, especially at the Secretariat, Cesar Montevecchio, Veronica Voss, and Jerry Powers, our fearless leaders. Um, in addition, we need to thank uh, the team of uh, nearly a dozen translators and IT specialists who've been working from 6 a.m. until 10 p.m. to make this, converse, this conference truly global in its virtual format. A, a couple of just final housekeeping items. First, we'll send everyone who's registered for the conference links to all of the sessions on YouTube so that you can watch any that you might've missed or share them with your networks. And given that one of CPN's uh, missions is to share what is going on in Catholic peace building around the world through our website, we would also like to invite you to let us know about your peace building initiatives and publications so that we can share them with the network through our website, our e-newsletter and on social media. And last, I'd like to thank all of the audience for being here and sharing in this experience with all of us. We wanted to close the conference with a moment of prayer. And so we're at the end of our session, but for those of you who can remain, um, we will be showing a short seven minute video. Uh, this is uh, Prayers of the Faith Faithful by more than two dozen Catholic peace builders around the world. And we'd like to close by playing it. This prayer is in English, but on the CPN YouTube channel, you can also find versions of it with subtitles in Spanish and in French. Bishop David Malloy, who is chairman of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on International Justice and Peace, introduces the video. So let us close our time together with prayer. the Catholic Peace Building Network and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and all our collaborators, I thank you for joining us for this international conference, Catholic Peace Building in Times of Crisis, Hope for a Wounded World. Indeed, the world is emerging from an historic health crisis that has exacerbated existing conflicts and economic and social disparities. The repercussions of a changing climate are increasingly felt among the poorest among us. The Russian invasion of Ukraine threatens global peace in unimaginable ways. And the local conflicts around the world stubbornly persist. The challenges are many. The voices for the poor and vulnerable are few. But the Christian faith is built on hope found in Christ Jesus. And in that hope, I welcome you in the words of St. Paul to the Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Агресія припинилася, щоб Бог дарував нам розсудливість знайти ненасильницькі способи вирішувати суперечки, і щоб мир Христовий завжди мав останнє слово. Святі Бориси і Глібе, моліться за нас. Насолі ліагілі гадетіна сіясіна, лікіяму любіддіятін ліджаді суплі салам, ванюмарсу дабтен нафсу валейчіджал, صفتان ضروريتان لتحقيق سبل سلام بجدية وبطريقة مستقيمة. Oremos por quienes han estado en lados opuestos del conflicto para que alcancen acuerdos que lleven a la reconciliación y porque nuestros líderes guíen a sus comunidades hacia la restauración, el perdón y la prosperidad. Nuestra Señora de Chiquinquirá ruega por nosotros. آئیے دعا کرے کہ تمام انسان مذہبی آزادی سے فیض یاب ہوں اور کہ تمام لوگ آپس میں دوستی اور ایک دوسرے کی خوبیوں کے احترام کے جذبے سے سرشار ہوں اور دوسروں کے دکھ درد کو محسوس کرنے کی اہلیت پیدا کریں اے خدا یہ دعا کرتے ہیں کہ سسٹر روت فاؤ کی مستقل مزاجی کی مثال 
हमेशा हमारी रहनुमा हो आमीन Manze washobore kushingira ntahe amakoro avuye ku mvugo nziza ya Yesu Kristo. Kamenye shimitima n'ibigenzo ushingiye ku kwitwara. Niko zimima na tatini mishel kayoya bisamira. Ipinapanalangin namin ang ganap na pagaling ng ating mundo. Naway ang ating pandaydig na komunidad ay humanap ng mga malikhaing paraan upang lutasin ang pagbabago sa klima. Naway tayo ay magpanday ng isang kinabukasan na magsusuporta sa pangmatagalang pag-unlad at naway sumikap tayo na itaguyod ang mga nagdusa dahil sa kawalan ng katarungan sa kalikasan. San Lorenzo Ruiz, ipanalangin mo kami. We pray that the world can move swiftly toward nuclear disarmament and end once and for all the dark specter of nuclear annihilation and bring us all closer to true security, prosperity, and peace. Pope St. John XXIII, pray for us. Oremos per la equidade en saúde, que a pandemia da COVID-19 mostrou ser extremamente deficiente, que todas as pessoas, independentemente do local de nascimento, possam ter acesso a atendimento médico humanizado, e medicamentos e vacinas que possam prevenir mortes e sofrimentos desnecessários. Mártires de Guiúa, rogai por nós. O Xavier, a Hagernaz, Caer Zolo, Naizer Mitfa, Manenet Masarat, Gavara, Gichetin, Nainesap, Hizvi, Chichapan, Naumala, como o Nuno Amlah, Sedrada Kesat, Naimim Bara, Malokutai, Kibrun Mabtin, Kriiza yikhil zikhaidan kunat zikhwana yikhun budin aitib kad wabutu gabra mikail lamin alna. Oramos para que la paz se instale en los corazones de todas las mujeres y hombres, que la enemistad y el odio sean reemplazados por la caridad y la esperanza, y que la conversión personal de los pueblos conduzca a la paz en nuestras comunidades. San Oscar Romero ruega por nosotros. Chuao bea wa fani di barua. Wakulima, walimu, wauguzi na madaktari, watumishi wa uma na wafanyikazi wote. Ewe mungu bariki juhudi zao na wazindishie riziki ili kukakidhi familia zao ili waweze kushiriki katika mfalme wa mungu. Malkia Maria wa upendo, utuombe. Gomet, kapri suple. Ba mwen gras l'espri sen an ak la sages pou mkab kreye plis opotinite ekonomik ak opotinite travay pou po vou yo kapab rive kase chen injustis, chen violans, chen la mize ak gran gou, chen kidnapin ak tout sa kan peche yo viv tan kou moun, tan kou piti tou, tan kou sitwayen pour nous capables d'arriver à construire ensemble la paix dans la société nous yo, en nous la prière. Tout ça me la paix à beaucoup de gens qui ont été écoles. Tout ça me la paix à beaucoup de gens qui ont été écoles, 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 Pe baba te la lokumu la mabota. Wa esengo isidon bakanja osambe la oya bisu. May the source of life and hope grant us these petitions. May God bless and sustain the work of all peace builders of all faiths. May the spirit bless and guide us these next days as we learn from one another and share our hope. Let us hold unwaveringly to our confession that gives us hope, for he who made the promise is trustworthy. Amen. <laughs>